No one ever taught us what tithing was. And because we've been encouraged to practice what we don't understand, we've become vulnerable to other ways of giving that cause those outside the church to mock how we raise money. I'm excited to bring to you some, some just wonderful news of how good God is. Can, can, I, can, I, can I give you all some good news? I mean, we, we've heard a whole lot of stuff that depressed us this week. Can I give you something that ought to make you shout? In just a few weeks, on February 10th, we'll celebrate the 16th Annual Historical Black College and University Festival that is sponsored by Alfred Street Baptist Church. For those who don't know, that festival began as a vision of four of our members, Sister Vance Davis, uh, Brother Henry Thompson, Deacon Bob Bogan, Deacon Alton Wallace. And they believe that the legacy of our HBCUs ought to be something that our children are exposed to and have an opportunity uh, to be encouraged to apply and to seek enrollment in those HBCUs. So we started 16 years ago down in the multi-purpose room, only for God to put his hand upon it and grow and grow and grow. Had to leave the multi-purpose room, had to go over to T.C. Williams, biggest high school in the city, and God put his hand on it, and it grew and grew and grew and grew, and we had to leave T.C. Williams because it's bigger than that venue. So this year, as you've already heard, we're headed over to the Gaylord Convention Center in Oxon Hill. To go over to the Gaylord, you know that there's a significant increase in cost. That venue is much larger, but we just believed it was God's will, and Myself, along with a lot of church leaders and those within our HBCU committee and our foundation, said, you know what, Pastor, here's an opportunity we have to let the world know about this festival and fair, which is the largest in the United States of America. So we started searching out for partners, corporate sponsors, to help us with the cost and to give us the platform that could publicize the great work we believe the world ought to know about this festival, this fair, and our HBCUs. We didn't want just any partner, though. We wanted someone with a global platform. We wanted somebody that could write a big check. Amen. And we wanted someone who shared our vision and our value and commitment towards education, and particularly of our HBCUs. And so we went around and we found, and we're grateful to God that the integrity of our church and the name of our foundation and the work that we've done in this festival, which has connected some 25 thousand students with our HBCUs and over six million dollars in scholarship and assistance has been given away to help young people, many of whom are going to college for the first time in their family. We found a corporate sponsor who this year is giving to our foundation $150,000 to underwrite the entire cost of our HBCU festival because they believe in the value of education. So this year, we are proud to present to you on February 10th, the 16th annual Alfred Street Baptist Church Historically Black College and University Festival brought to you by Facebook. Amen. Facebook has decided to underwrite our college festival affair. Can you help me give glory to God for that great and wonderful partnership? Amen. I hope you realize the magnitude of that partnership. Almost unprecedented. It says a lot about Facebook, that they would search out and believe in the value of HBCUs and in an unprecedented way would partner with a historically black Baptist church to underwrite the cost of a mission and ministry that started in the basement of our church. Uh, it says a lot about their commitment to education to know that in an unprecedented way this partnership has been formed and they're looking for it to be long term and ongoing for many years to come so we're excited about the future that God will give us with this partnership it says a lot about that festival and fair and I want to acknowledge and thanks God for those visionaries as well as those who volunteered over these 16 years eyes did not see and ears could not have heard nor was it even in their mind that one day we would be at the Gaylord. There was no Gaylord Convention Center when this thing started. And now we'll be over there and be funded by Facebook. The world will know about our HBCUs because of the vision of those that started in the basement of a church. And it says something about the integrity and name of Alfred Street Baptist Church. 
The Bible says that a good name is to be valued above silver and gold because when you've got a good name and you've been faithful with the assignment God has given you, God will partner you with the right people to do his work and his will in the world. I want to thank our HBCU committee. I want to thank um, those who labor and will volunteer. Especially want to acknowledge Brother John Rosenthal, who was one of those diligent men and brothers out there searching for corporate partnership that pitched it. We've got some friends and family in Facebook. I told y'all, Alfred Street is everywhere. Amen. And when it was mentioned, there were some folk that said, yep, that's exactly what you all need to do. So thanks be to God for all the voices and the hands and the heart that he used to make this partnership possible. And we're looking forward to the great things that God will do going forward. There are some amazing things happening at Alfred Street Baptist Church, and to God be the glory for the great things that the Lord has done. To God be the glory for all the great things the Lord has done. Would you bow and be in prayer with me? Lord, we thank you even at the beginning of this year for the grace, the mercy, the favor, and the faithfulness that has been blessing us. We are not of our own, but because you are God and the giver of every good and perfect gift. Pray now, God, that you'd once again work the miracle of speaking through frail and fragile flesh. That you touch my mind and my mouth, use my head and my heart. Allow there to be no gap between your will and my words. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to get into part two of the series we started on last week, entitled Money Matters. Reminding ourselves that how we use money speaks volumes about our character and our relationship with God. Today, I want you to hear the reading of a passage of scripture that ought to sound familiar to anyone that's ever been raised in a Baptist church. I'm gonna invite you to the Old Testament book of the prophet Malachi. Now, if you don't know where Malachi is, go to Matthew and go back one page. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And in the third chapter of Malachi, there are some words that all sound familiar to us. I invite those who are physically able to stand with me as together we reverence the reading of God's holy word from Malachi chapter 3. Hear the word of the Lord from the New King James Version. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Yeah. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness yeah. against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien a foreigner, an immigrant from Cuba and El Salvador and African nations. Because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your father, you've gone away from my ordinances and you have not kept them. Return to me. And I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Here it is. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you said, Lord, in what way have we robbed you? I'll tell you how. In tithes and offerings. Bring, excuse me, you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open up for you 
the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And, somebody say and. and. That's not the only blessing. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Tithing 101. I was raised, as I've shared with you multiple times, in a very traditional, old-school, sold-out, bona fide, black Baptist church. And there's some things I know simply because in that old-school Baptist church, there were some things we did every week. There's very little that changed in our worship. The sermon title may change. The choir that sang may be different. But if you went to Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, 10706 South Michigan Avenue on the south side of Chicago, there were some things we did every week. Deacons at Lilydale were not like the deacons at Alfred Street. No, because at Lilydale, deacons led devotion. Wasn't no praise and worship team. You had three deacons down front. One would line a hymn, the other would read a scripture, and the last one would pray a prayer. And Dr. Smith, he prayed the same prayer every week. We could pray the prayer with him. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thou who was before there was a was and shall be when is ain't no more. God, we thank you for allowing our golden moments to roll on just a little while longer. Thank you for waking us with a reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank you that last night the four corners of our bed were not the four corners of our cooling board. Lord, here we stand, head bowed and body bent. He prayed the same prayer every week. And when deacons were over, done with devotion, they would turn us over into the hands of the rostrum. I don't know what a rostrum is, but we were turned over to them every Sunday. Every Sunday after the devotions, the choir would process in. And that took about 25, 30 minutes. Because they practiced their choreography more than they rehearsed their song. Once the choir was in the loft, every Sunday, we sang the Lord's Prayer. Not that quick version. I'm talking about the 12 to 15 minute remix extended B-side of the Lord's Prayer. And afterwards, we'd have a responsive reading out the back of that old green hymnal. Every Sunday, Sister Sadie Willis would walk from the back of the church to the announcement table, but she didn't read the announcements. She read the entire bulletin. And would end every week telling you what the menu for dinner was after church. And it was the same thing every week. Fried chicken, green beans, mashed potatoes, and rolls. And because we were a bougie black church, we would take some sherbet and mix it with ginger ale. And Kevin, that was called frappe. The same thing every Sunday. After the announcements, we acknowledge the guests. Now, you didn't just wave your hand. No, no. You had to stand up, give us your name, and tell us what church you went to. And in case we thought you were lying, we asked you the pastor's name, just, just to be sure. 
every Sunday, we would sing Amazing Grace before Dr. Jackson got up to preach. And every Sunday, around 12.55, 12.56 p.m., Sister Cordelia Mae John would get happy. She caught the Holy Ghost at 12.55 every Sunday. And she would stand up and start running around church hollering Jesus. You could set your watch to Sister Cordelia Mae John. Every Sunday, Dr. Jackson ended his sermon at Calvary. The sermon may have started with Moses, may have been about Noah, but could have been about David. But by the time it was over, every Sunday, he would say, he died. And it'd get good to him, he'd say, I know he died. And if you wasn't hollering, he'd say, didn't he die? <laughs> every Sunday, after that sermon was over, we raised an offering. Because it ain't a Baptist church if you don't raise an offering. And we knew it was offering time because the same two things happened every Sunday. The musicians start playing, you can't beat God's giving. No matter how hard you try. Because the more you give, the more he gives to you. Just keep on giving because it's really true that you can't beat God's giving. And as they played, a deacon would get up. And every Sunday, he read out of Malachi 3. Now, we couldn't find Malachi in the Bible, but we knew what it said. Because every Sunday, we heard this question. And, and you ain't got no old school Baptist in you if you don't know the question that was asked before the offering. Will a man rob God? And you ask, how have you robbed me in tithes and in offering? And then they would call for the tithers to come. No, we didn't pass no offering tray. The tithers stood up and they walked down the aisle with dignity and pride and laid their tithe at the altar. And then the rest of y'all, whosoever will, <laughs> were encouraged to give. We were a tithing church. And the amazing thing, for as much emphasis as they put on tithing, I can never recall being taught what tithing was. We heard it, we witnessed it, but nobody ever taught us what it really meant. Y'all, and it's a shame to be encouraged to practice something you don't understand. All right. I'm embarrassed to tell you that for the first 15, maybe 16 years of my life, I thought it was a tide. <laughs> and that we were calling for the tiders to come, those who wash their clothes and special No one ever taught us what tithing was. And because we've been encouraged to practice what we don't understand, we've become vulnerable to other ways of giving that cause those outside the church to mock how we raise money. Everybody in here, if you think about it, you know at least one somebody that will not go to church ever again because they were in a service and the way they rose money left a bad taste in their mouths. Those who think it's gimmicks, those who think this is a predatory environment, those who would laugh at you and scorn you for giving your money to the church. You've seen offering tactics and techniques. You ever been in a church where they started with the $100 givers? And after everybody with $100, they call for the $50 line. I've been in the church, Dick Knowles, where they raised the offering. They went in the back and counted it. And then they came back out and said, we need to pass the trade one more again. 
You ever been to church that raised building fund, but they ain't never built nothing? <laughs> Have you ever seen a preacher proclaiming the word of God and folk run up to the altar and throw money down? And as a result, the church has gotten a bad name because we've strayed away from what the Bible teaches is really the primary way to give to the Lord, the tithe. And so in this month of January, I've decided by the guiding of the Holy Spirit, talk about money matters. Last week in the sermon for the love of money, we tried to answer the question why we give to God. We give because it glorifies God. We give because it governs our own financial life. We give because it reveals the God in us. We give because it's an act of generosity and an expression of gratitude. That's why we give. Today I want to talk about how we give and start our journey with tithing. When one searches scripture, you'll find that even before there was a covenant with Abraham and there was a commandment to give, that men and women instinctively brought offerings to the Lord. Make sure you see this. Before the Lord said to bring it, we find in Scripture evidence that people brought offerings to the Lord. All you need to do is read to Genesis chapter 4. That whole Cain and Abel fiasco started because both Cain and Abel realized that we are not the source of the goodness we have received. And because the Lord has blessed us instinctively, there is a desire to give something back to God. Because giving to the Lord should not be a matter of commandment. It should not be an issue of imperative. It should not be relegated to the law. It should come from the heart that realizes that God has been good to me. And because God's been good to me, there's something inside of me that wants to give back to God. I would suggest to you that it is the immature heart who can be blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and never wonder what I should give back to God. That it's the heart that wants to give to God to bring an offering. And in Scripture, you're going to find lots of different types of offerings. A heave offering, a burnt offering, a free will offering, a sacrificial offering, a meat offering, and then a very special and specific type of offering called a tithe. What I want to do for the next few moments that I have your attention is try to teach you about tithing by answering the seven most frequently asked questions about tithe so that at least you might understand what it is we teach and what it is God expects of us in our giving. Question number one, what is a tithe? Where does that word come from? That is not language we use in the world. What is a tithe? The word tithe that we first see in Genesis chapter 27, speaking about Abram's gift to Melchizedek, is the Hebrew word ma'aser. And literally translated, ma'aser means a tenth. So a tithe is a tenth. A tithe is a tenth. A tithe is a tenth of what? A tenth of whatever God has blessed me with. That the children of Israel understood that the harvest is not up to us. That if we reap a harvest, it's because God has been gracious. And if the Lord has blessed us with what we know we could not get of ourselves, then when we see what the Lord has given, we need to take a 
tenth of that and give it back unto the Lord, that my tithe is a tenth of whatever blessing God has given, whatever resource God has given, whatever income God has given, whatever finances God has given, whatever salary God has given. Whenever God has blessed me financially, my tithe is a tenth that goes back to God. And the Lord says, the tithe is holy to me. Leviticus 27, 30, the Lord says, you know what? The tithe is not yours, it's mine. So technically, biblically speaking, you should not say my tithe. It's not yours. It is holy to God. It belongs to God. It is the Lord's tithe that I render back unto God that when I see God has blessed me, I take a tenth of that blessing and write God on it and I give it back to the Lord because the Lord commands me to bring his tithe to his house. Now, I don't mean insult your intelligence, but a tenth helps you determine how much you're supposed to give. It's real simple. Look at everything you've earned in a giving earning period and move the decimal one place to the left. If you earned $750, move the decimal one place to the left and the tithe that belongs to God is $75. If you earned $1,250 in your pay period, Move the decimal to the left, and your tithe is $125. I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but I don't want you leaving here talking about you don't know how to figure out your tithe. (laughs) If you earned $5,000, move the decimal one place to the left, and what you owe God is $500. A tithe is a tenth of what the Lord has blessed me with. Which leads to question number two that I already know you're asking. Well, do I tithe from my net income or my gross income? You've been waiting on that one. That, and I know what answer you want me to give you. Let me say this before we get into a biblical answer. I fully believe God would be pleased with you choosing either one. Can you just start with one? I'll give you an A for effort if you just try to start with one. Um, Obviously, your net is less than your gross. So here's the question I have to ask you to set up the answer. Why is your net less than your gross? Why is your net less than your gross? It's not just taxes. Let me tell you why your net is less than your gross. Yes, taxes, but let me tell you why it's less. Because the government don't trust you. They don't trust that if you get your gross, you'll give them what they require. So they take it from you first. And what you have in your net is not what God blessed you with, it's what's left over after the government decided to show up first. And you and I both know the easiest way to mess your life up is to let anything or anyone come before God. Your net can be less than your gross not because of taxes, but retirement, 529 college plans, that lean you got. (laughs) Student loans. And what will happen is if you decide to tithe off of net, although good, what you're saying is the tenth doesn't come from what God blessed me with. I'm going to take a tenth from what's left over after I put other things above God. And so the biblical answer is that my goal is to tithe from my gross because that's what God blessed me with. It's not God's fault the government doesn't trust you. 
God said, I bless you with all of this. The tithe should come from all of this, not what's left over. So I'm supposed to tithe from my gross. Well, well, Pastor, uh, question number three then is, uh, what about um, uh, unexpected income? You know, uh, bonuses, uh, uh, commissions, uh, birthday money, uh, lottery, Mega Million, Powerball, you name it, uh, MGM. Does the Lord require me to bring a tithe from unexpected money? The easy answer that I apply to my life is this. If I can thank God for it, then I ought to tithe from it. Because if I know the Lord is responsible for blessing me with what I need, if God is true that he will go exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think, that means that when we th what we think we're going to receive is a budgeted amount, but God has a way of surprising us with monies we did not budget for, we did not expect, and we did not see coming. If I know that I can thank God that he went exceedingly and abundantly above what I could ask or think, then I am obligated to tithe from what I know the Lord blessed me with. If I scratched it off and I got it, it's a blessing from the Lord. So I tithe from what I know God has given. Well, next question, but, but, but what if I'm temporarily unemployed? What if I have no salary coming in? Or if there's no income? Then there's no obligation to tithe. You're not robbing from God if there's no income to take a tenth from. You only have to tithe when there's income. So if you're temporarily unemployed and not earning, you do not have a tithing obligation. But if you're receiving unemployment, <laughs> then you are obligated to tithe from the unemployment that comes in because that's God's way of blessing. Okay, well, how often do I have to do this? With what frequency should you tithe? This is really a matter of personal preference and financial management. We have some members of our church who wait till the end of the year to tithe. They want to see everything they've earned through the year and then take a tenth of that and give it away. Now, some people can do that. Most of us don't manage money well enough that at the end of the year, you'd have a tenth of everything you earned no, somebody say, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. He ain't talking to me. So the easiest answer is to align your giving with your pay. If you're paid weekly, tithe weekly. If you're paid bi-weekly, tithe bi-weekly. If you're paid monthly, tithe monthly. Because by aligning your giving with your pay, you're developing the discipline necessary so that you become accustomed to giving. So much so, watch this, there are those in this church who will tell you, you feel uncomfortable and out of order if you've been blessed and don't tithe. Let me see the next one. There's some of you right now, you, shut that off. <laughs> tell them they're supposed to be in church anyway. Uh, there's some of you who, you love church so much and are so disciplined in the coming, how many people here by way of hand know you feel awkward when you don't come to church on Sunday? Like there's just something weird about sitting at home. Some more of y'all are waving your hand. Just, just act. <laughs> Somebody said, Reverend, I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. Uh, but you can become so disciplined that sitting at home on a Sunday feels awkward. Like when I go on vacation, I still go to church. I go to somebody else's church. I don't, I don't dress up. I don't want nobody to know who I am. I sit in the back. But I got to go to church because I don't feel right sitting at home on the Lord's day. And you can be so disciplined in tithing that when the Lord blesses you, your first instinct is to give it back to God. 
Because tithing is a discipline that you develop that every time God blesses, I'm going to tithe. Every time God sends income, I'm going to tithe. Every time a bonus comes, I'm going to tithe. Every time I find some money, I'm going to tithe. The real disciplined person, person will find extra $20 bills in their pocket in the laundry and give two of them to the Lord. I'm so disciplined that I give whenever I'm blessed. All right, question number six then. I know you, here's the question you want to know. Um, what about my charitable giving? Does my giving to other organizations count towards my tithe? No. <laughs> it is good to give to charitable organizations. It's good to support the NAACP. It's good to sow to the goodwill. It's good to support Red Cross. It's good to give to the monies that your organizations raise to change our communities. But that money does not count towards the tithe. Your organizations don't take a tithe. The tithe is a specific tenth that is given to God to sow into the body of God that you belong to that God uses to change the world. Here's what he says in Malachi. Bring my tithe to my house. So that wherever you go to worship, wherever you go to receive a word, wherever your life is being touched, wherever your name is on the membership roster, you have an obligation to take a tenth of what God has given you and sow it into the church where you belong. Can I tell you what damages the church? Those who are blessed but won't give. Here's what God says, because I know you're mad at me now. Here's what the Lord says. Um, if I bless you and you won't bring your tithe to the place where you're being blessed, you're robbing me. Now, where I'm from, I need you to know there's a difference between stealing and robbing. When you steal, you try not to get caught. When you steal, you don't want anybody to know you've done. Stealing is when you take that package of paper from the supply room because you need some paper for your printer at home. Somebody say, that's stealing. that's stealing. Robbing is when you stand in someone's face and say, I'm taking your stuff and there's nothing you can do about it. And God says that when I bless you, and you come to church and refuse to render the tithe, you are standing in my face and saying, God, I know it's yours, but you can't have it, and there's nothing you can do about it. We had a debate, Dustin, the other day. We were at CJ's birthday, and we started debating uh, who's the best musician, Prince or Michael Jackson. The answer is Prince. And we started naming some of our favorite Prince songs. You know, Purple Rain, Adore, 1999, Red Corvette. I told them my favorite Prince song is Thieves in the Temple. Because I pastor a church. And I know there's some thieves in the temple tonight. Some of y'all need to listen to get home. Uh, so the Lord says, listen, that has to be sown in, and that answers the last question, which is the purpose of my tithe. What happens with it? In two weeks, I'm going to share a sermon that you probably never heard from a pastor. It's called Show Me the Money. And I'm going to open up the account of Alpha Street Baptist Church and share with you where your money goes so that you know what happens to the money you sow into the body of Christ. It doesn't just disappear without any accountability. Right? You need to know what happens with your money, how your money is used to support the work of the church. And here's the amazing thing that God declares, that if my people would tithe, my house would never be in debt. Hear me, this deep. God's vision for a church matches what God knows the financial capacity of that church is. God knows what he blessed you with. God knows what your tithe ought to be. We don't know it. Nobody here searches your W-2. We will never ask for your W-2 to find out whether you are faithful in giving or not because you got to give an account to God for that. But God knows how much you earn. 
and God calculates the tithe and gives a vision that he knows can be supported by the tithing of the membership of a church. So I say to you that if all 8,000 members of this church decide to be faithful in their tithe, we could build that building without ever borrowing a dollar from any bank. Can you imagine the witness to the world of a $95 million church being built without owing anything. You think Facebook likes us. Boy, Google will show up, Amazon will come knocking. That the tithe supports the work of the church and a full tithing church doesn't demand you give anything else. A tithing church doesn't sell fried chicken dinners. Tithing church doesn't wash cars to raise money. A tithing church says we've done what God asked us to do. There are no fees to join anything in this church. Everything the church do or does will be sponsored by the giving of the members in the full tithe. What happens to your tithe? It supports the church. What happens to your tithe? Here it comes. You ready to shout? It comes back to you. When you tithe, hear me, your tithing envelope is a self-addressed stamped envelope that when you give it to the Lord, the Lord is already preparing to send it back to you. The Bible says, when you bring my tithe, see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you don't have room enough to receive. I have some witnesses in here that when I was faithful with my tithe, God sent it right back to me. He will cause you to overflow. When you're faithful, it comes back and some and causes you to overflow as long as you don't go buy a bigger cup. Here's the benefit of tithing. When I'm content at my level, I don't need a new car, I don't need a bigger house. I tithe, the Lord pours into me, I start to overflow. I bless those around me. I'm leaving a legacy for my children and my children's children. My debt is paid off. It comes back to you. And God says, I will rebuke the devourer. You see the blessings that come, you never know what he kept. There were things God said, I blocked from you because you were faithful. That when you give the tithe, it'll come back to you and some. When you release the 10%, God will send 100 back. All right, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. I want to prove it. Um, I've got uh, an example of something I want to show, and I need to find an unemployed, temporarily unemployed member of Alpha Street now. I would ask if you're in the sanctuary, but there's some other people that are worshiping that never get, that it's just sometimes not, not as fair for them. So I've got someone in overflow right now looking, in overflow. Some security people are there. We're looking for a temporarily unemployed member of Alpha Street Baptist Church. If you are a member of Alpha Street Baptist Church in overflow and you are temporarily unemployed, I need you to raise your hand and security is going to bring one of you into the sanctuary. They're on their way. They're on their way even now. Someone's coming. Believe in that. So you mad you got in the sanctuary. You thought you got lucky today, right? <laughs> cool. Got here in time to get in. Uh, but I'm asking security to bring me a member of the church who's temporarily unemployed out of overflow. Out of overflow. Um, I want to show you an example of how God gives back when you decide to be faithful over the tithe. Uh, there's no one there? Really? There's no temporarily unemployed? Really? Are we sure? Are we sure before I, before I go in a different direction? No hands raised. In the sanctuary, start, let me do this, balcony. Balcony. Any temporarily unemployed member of Alpha Street Baptist Church in the balcony? Not this, the Lord. There is one. Where's the hand? I can't see it. Come on down. Is it brother or sister? 
Huh? Someone was downstairs? See there, I told you, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> I apologize, I, said, I, I know, I, I'm gonna try to bless overflow. You know, see me after church, so I got something for you anyway. Um, are they bringing them up? Is that you? Sister, you come, come on, come on. This is our sister. She's a member of our church. <laughs> Temporarily unemployed. Yes. What's your name? Jasmine. Jasmine, what's your last name? Copeland. Jasmine Copeland? Copeland. Copeland. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sister Jasmine Copeland. Jasmine, we know that being unemployed is a tough thing, and I know that you're searching. And so what I want to do from my heart and the heart of this church is give you a gift. This wow. has 10 $5 bills in it. It's $50. Still amazing. I, well, yes, and I want you to take care of Jasmine today. I want you to do whatever it is you need to take care of. Here are 10 $5 bills just for you, Jasmine, all right? Bless you. Can I have a hug, Jasmine? Bless you. Bless you. You go sit back down. Bless you. Hey, Jasmine. 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 Do me a favor, Jasmine. I, I know you're a little emotional right now. I just gave you 10 $5 bills. So I'm gonna ask for what I know you already have. I'm not asking for what you don't have. I gave you 10 $5 bills. Would you trust God to give me one of them back? If you would. When you're grateful, giving the one is easy. If you just give me one. Now, because you did that, I'm gonna give you 50 more, all right? Jasmine, Jasmine, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I just gave you 50 more, right? God just blessed you again. So what do you do with that? Just another one, right? If you give me that five, five I'll give you 50 more, all right? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? If you and I, I'll give you 50 more, all right? What do you want to do, Jasmine? What you want to do? How long you want to keep this going? You give me five, I'll give you 50 more. All right? This is how God works it. All right? That you came to church today with no expectation of what would happen to you. But God knows your need. And if you trust him to continue to give back, even in tough times, he continues to bless you. Jasmine, take care of yourself. Be blessed. Be blessed. all I want to close with. Let me tell you what the Bible says, and we'll close. God simply says, try me. It's the only place in Scripture where God says, I dare you. I dare you to trust me in your finances. I dare you to bring the tithe. I'm from the street. This is what he really says, I wish you would. I wish you would step out and trust me with your finances and watch how I will bless you. Now, before we go to the table, this is the third time we've done this this weekend, and some questions were raised that need to be asked. Someone said, well, Pastor, was that, was that staged? And does she have to give you the money back? That, that's how much we've been taught to mistrust generosity. In the church, we think something's always suspect. But God blesses us in ways that don't make sense. Right? This was not staged. I didn't know Jasmine. And this is not church money. I didn't ask the deacons or trustees for the money. That's from pastor. And I just believe that God's going to bring it back to me in amazing ways. So I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for it. Because he'll take care of me. How many people know God is faithful? God is faithful. 
And that's what brings us to our table this morning. It's a reminder that our God is faithful. And that even when things look their worst, God has something glorious on the other side. That is our eternal hope. That suffering doesn't last forever. Unemployment is not permanent. We serve a God who says, if you'll trust me when you're struggling, watch how I'll bless you. Try me. I dare you. I wish you would. And see what I would do for you.